All right, thank you. So I guess this is my last chance to try to get my point across. Uh, so before getting it buried in calculations again, let me try to explain what's the general idea of, of obstruction bundle gluing. So su suppose we want to glue a bunch of things together. Usually we'll talk about holomorphic curves, although I, my examples so far were Morse theory. So suppose we have, I have a bunch of holomorphic curves UI and I want to glue them together. Um, now, so there's some moduli space M. So this moduli space M consists of uh, configurations of the UI together with some gluing parameters. So in general, these holomorphic curves might themselves live in some moduli spaces. So for any, for any collection of holomorphic curves in their respective moduli spaces, and then some gluing parameters saying like how much we translate things, et cetera, we can try to glue. Now the best situation is where the, all of these linearized operators, so DI is the linearized equation for UI, the best situation is when these operators are surjective. And then there's no obstruction to gluing, and you can just use the usual construction, and everything's fine. Um, the second best situation is where these operators are maybe not surjective, but their co-kernels have constant dimension. Okay, so as you move around in the moduli space, the dimension of the co-kernel of this operator doesn't jump, so that I have an actual vector bundle over the space M of configurations, where the fiber over a point in this vector bundle is the sum of the co-kernels of all of the operators for all of the pieces. And this is when we have a well-defined obstruction bundle. The worst case is where these co-kernels, co-kernel dimensions may jump. Then you're in Kuranishi land or polyfold land. You say, so that's when you really need to do something fancy. So this obstruction bundle case is sort of in between the classical case where everything works fine and the general case where you need hot, really high technology to, to solve the problems. Okay, so now, so let's consider this obstruction bundle case. Um, so then you can try to glue and you write down the gluing equations and there's an obstruction. So you can glue up to elements of the co-kernels of all of these operators. And so you can then define an obstruction section S. So S inputs a uh, gluing configuration and gluing parameters and outputs the obstruction to gluing. And whenever S is equal to zero, you can glue. And in general, you can prove that this construction gives you a bijection from the zero set of S to the set of possible gluings. And then you want to understand what are the zeros of S. And the section S is defined in some strange indirect way from the gluing equations. So we want to approximate S by something easier to understand. So S0 is this linearized section. Which is obtained basically from taking the leading order terms in S and throwing everything else away. And then you argue, so if you're trying to do some count of the number of zeros of S, then in general this moduli space M is going to have some boundary. So, so the gluing parameters can only be in some certain range. Um, and you argue that on the boundary of this moduli space, the terms in S0 are much bigger than all of the other terms in S. And so if you linearly deform S to S0, zeros never, never cross the boundary. So any, count of, any kind of count of zeros that you can make will be the same for S and S0. So then you just have to understand the zeros of S0 and then the idea of S0, I think I didn't explain this so well last time, so let me try again. Um, so, for each of these holomorphic curves or whatever that you're trying to glue, there's a component of S0 in the co-kernel of that operator. Um, and that the contribution, so, to, so the component of S0 for one of these curves has contributions for all of the things that are adjacent to it, for all of the things that are being glued to it. So if I look at this U5, I want to say what is the U5 component of this section? So for each of these curves, U1, U2, 
and U7, there's a contribution which comes from the asymptotic, asymptotics of the end of that curve that's getting glued to U5. So there's a contribution here from the asymptotics of this end of U1, a contribution from the asymptotics of this end of U2, and a contribution from the asymptotics of this end of U7. Um, so basically you look at the asymptotic expansion of this curve and you, you can write a kind of Fourier expansion of it in terms of eigenvalues of the linearized operator and you look at the leading order term of that, excuse me, eigenvalues of the asymptotic operator. And you look at the leading order term, it's going to have some exponential decay. So this contribution is going to look like e to the minus r lambda, where lambda is the eigenvalue and r is the amount that you translate this curve. Right? So that's the, that's the basic idea. Um, and then if, if all goes well, you can then actually count the zeros of S0 to figure out how many gluings there are. So are there any questions about this general picture before I plunge into my next example? Yeah. So when we do the gluing, the, this, for example, U7 part dominates in that end, and we do the gluing construction using S0 corresponding to that whatever highest uh, eigenvalue is. Mm -hmm. but, and then we do it for U2, U1, but I, I'm confused about how we do the gluing in between these, uh, like in, in, the, in the interior of U5. Like how do we glue the part coming from U2 and the part coming from U7? How does that happen automatically? I'm just confused about that. How does what glue to So we glue near the, <coughs> the connection with U7. So here? Yeah. Okay. And then you glue in the, near the connection with U2. Uh -huh. But that those two things should come together to... Well, these don't really interact. I mean, these are sort of far away from each other. Uh, but the levels of the building, there's some... Uh, so, I mean, there should still be a U5 giving those two gluings, no? So we're sort of doing the whole gluing at once. So we're sort of pre-gluing. So I guess in this example, I've got, I've got three levels. Um, and you know, these, so I translate these guys up by some large amount. They can move by different amounts up. I translate this one down by some amount. And actually these guys can also translate up and down with respect to each other. Um, and I pre-glue using some cutoff functions. And then I, def I deform using sections of the tangent bundle over each of these curves. And then I solve this whole system of equations for all these thetas to be zero, or at least in the co-kernel of the operators. So um, somehow in the glued holomorphic curve, in the interior of U5, nothing seems to change. Well, it changes a little bit. But how, how does that a little bit change happen? I, I, I'm missing that point. Well, I mean, there's a section psi 5, which describes how much I'm moving U5 to in the gluing. But then we multiply those by cutoff functions, which just die. Out. Well, the cutoff, I mean, there's a cutoff function beta 5 for u5, which is supported on u5, and it dies, it dies on sort of the ends of u5. And then there's a function psi, psi 5, which tells me how much I'm moving u5. So, so I am moving the whole thing. Uh -huh. and, and, okay, and, okay, so the obstruction, okay, I understand now. There is no equation for psi 5, come, like, which uh, contributes to this uh, kind of obstruction gluing procedure. That part is already solved. That part is zero on the nose. And then for the other, like the, this psi, psi 2 part, then I should, I get some condition. Something should vanish in the of this co-kernel of the eye. Some number, that number should be zero. But for the other one, Number is already zero. Yeah, I don't really quite understand. Okay, all, all right. If you're happy, I'm happy. Okay, other, other questions? Just maybe ask him a question. How many equations are uh, you going to write down for this picture? Uh, seven. <laughs> What's so funny? <laughs> so philosophically, say, if you look at the, at the top floor, if I would, it, you look at maps modulo a common R action. Yeah, that, that, that is on each level. Um, In principle, I mean, the object is, if you look at isomorphisms, is 
a map modulo the image shifted by R in, in, in R cross V. Well, it depends what you're trying to do. I mean, you could shift the different components. No, but these are different, but this are different isomorphism classes of objects. If you oh, okay, okay. So, so if, but, but that would, of course, in the modulized space be a different point. I mean, if, 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 uh, so, for, so from my perspective, I think basically you, you, you glue isomorphism class. In some sense, you glue isomorphism classes. Mm. And then you have two gluing parameters in this case, which is sort of, if you look at the average value at some points distributed here, the average value here is how they go apart. Okay. I guess it, it sort of depends on what, pro what exactly what problem you're trying to solve, whether you, you want to glue things, well, you want what, exactly what kind of equivalence class you want to glue. So, so am, I, am I right in thinking in this picture there are two gluing parameters? Well, from Helmut's point of view, yes. From my point of view, there would be uh, more, because uh, there would be one, two, three, four, five, six gluing parameters. But he, he can't sort of moving the thing in, on a level against each other is the same, where I don't. Yeah, okay. I, I, I so, so then I have more objects there, that's where the parameters then come from. Okay. Maybe, I think the definition of the SFT multi space also counts those as, as different things. Okay. All right, that's fine. So let's just not, fine. So from that point, if you're solving, trying to solve that problem, then there are just two glowing parameters. Yes? I think the modular space would be the same. So, um, I guess a tangential question. So, you, again, you're assuming the dimensions of all the co-kernels are the same. Uh -huh. Is that right? Um, so then what about, like, I guess you also need that the dimension of the co-kernel and, like, the interior of the modular space is also the same? Well, I'm not sure what that means. I mean, each of these pieces lives in some modular space, which is not breaking or anything. So this, this U5 lives in some moduli space of unbroken things. Right, so presumably that's like a piece of the boundary of some larger moduli space. Yeah, this, so this whole configuration is part of the boundary of some moduli space. And we're trying to understand how many ways can we glue this boundary or corner configuration to something in the interior of that moduli space. <laughs> All right, so let's, let's do an example. So I'm going to talk about um, a non-degenerate contact three manifold. Uh, so we have the ray vector field R. Uh, we have J, a uh, generic almost complex structure on R cross Y, satisfying the usual conditions, which I wrote down last time. We want to, we want to glue holomorphic curves in R cross Y. Um, so let me talk a little bit about branched covers of trivial cylinders. So suppose gamma is an elliptic ray orbit. <coughs> elliptic, simple ray orbit. So what does elliptic mean? Well, um, here's my orbit gamma. So it's a periodic orbit of the vector field R. And you can look at the um, normal bundle to this ray orbit, which is actually sort of identified with the, the contact, contact plane field restricted to this ray orbit. Um, and the derivative of this flow defines a map from this normal plane at a given point in gamma to itself. So you just look at the derivative of the flow like this, defines a linear map. Uh, so linearized return map. From the contact plane at some, say, gamma of 0. This has a symplectic form on it defined by d lambda, the linearized return map preserves this symplectic form, so it's a two by two symplectic matrix. Non-degenerate means it does not have one in its spectrum. An elliptic means that this map is conjugate to a rotation. By some angle two pi theta, 
So theta is sort of like a rotation number of this orbit. And, and the non-degeneracy of the orbit and all of its multiple covers tells us that theta is irrational. Um, and then we have the trivial cylinder R cross gamma and R cross Y. So this is a holomorphic cylinder because of the usual conditions on J. Then we want to, I want to talk about branched covers of this trivial cylinder. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. It's lost. No, it's creeping up. Uh, where's this hook? By the, by the time I figure out really, by, by the time I master these chalkboards, my course will be over. <laughs> um, all right, so suppose I have a branched cover uh, so this is a degree D branch cover of the cylinder where sigma let's say has genus G, it's connected in genus G, uh, and let's say it has uh, positive ends of multiplicity A1 through AK. So in other words, if I, um, so here's R cross gamma, and I have this surface that's, that's covering it, Um, so each end of the surface is going to give me a, a covering of the sort of end of the cylinder of some multiplicity. So the positive ends of multiplicities AI, the negative ends have multiplicity uh, B1 through BL, and the sum of the AIs and the sum of the BJs must equal D, because it's a, the whole thing has degree D. Um, so this has a, a complex structure on it pulled back from the complex structure on the cylinder. This is a perfectly good holomorphic curve. Um, it's a nice example of failure of transversality. It's like the, so Chris Wendell did the sort of a closed version, a version of this for closed curves in his talks. And this is a, um, a sort of relative version of that. Um, so why does the transversality fail? Well, what's, what's, the in, what's the Fredholm index of this curve? So the index of this map U0, well, in general, for the index of any curve in a, in a R cross a contact three manifold is minus the Euler characteristic of the domain um, plus twice some relative first turn class. So, so this notation is, so, so tau is a trivialization of the contact plane over all of the ray orbits. And this C tau is the relative first turn class of the contact plane field um, restricted to this curve U. Then there's a sum of conley tainter terms. So you have the sum of the positive ends of the conley tainter index of the ray orbit with respect to the trivialization tau minus the sum over the negative ends of the conley sander index, <laughs> index of the negative ends. The same, same formula works in any number of dimensions, except the minus chi gets replaced by n minus 3 times chi. We're, OK. Um, now, in this particular case, um, I can just use the same trivialization for every, everything coming from some given trivialization of gamma, um, and then 
Uh, Excuse me. The, the turbization is excited, trivialized along all together. So tau is a trivialization of xi over the ray orbits. So the index of u0 is minus earlier characteristic of sigma. Um, and this first turn class goes away if you use the same trivialization of, of gamma. So then I have plus the, plus the Conley-Sander stuff. Um, so what that comes out to be Uh, so it's 2g minus 2 uh, plus k plus l. So that's minus the earlier characteristic of the curve. Um, and then, so if I fix some trivialization, this then the this uh, ray the linearized return map for this ray orbit gamma is a rotation by, by 2 pi theta. And the conley sanger index um, is a... Uh, so if I have the conley sanger index of gamma itself is 2 times the floor of theta plus 1. Um, and then if I'm looking at an AI fold multiple cover, then that has the linearized return map for that is a rotation by ai times theta. So I get 2 times the floor of ai theta plus 1. So that's the sum of the conley sanger index terms um, for the positive ends. And then for the negative ends, I have minus sum from j equals 1 to l of 2 times the floor of uh, bj theta plus 1. And for convenience, I'm going to write this a little differently. I'll write this as 2 times the ceiling of Bj theta minus 1. So could you say again why the relative turn class vanishes? Um, because the trivialization, if I use the same trivialization coming from a given trivialization of gamma, then that trivialization extends over the entire curve. And so the first turn class is 0. So the first term, relative first term class is sort of the obstruction to extending the boundary trivialization over the whole curve. Can you use the branch point? Yeah, yeah, it's still okay. Yeah. But it's because you have a cinnamon, right? Otherwise, you add some dinner Yeah, I mean, the, everything's just mapping to this one ray orbit. I trivialize the contact plane field over it. Okay, so now I can, uh, oh, I did that, the, sorry, that's not the way I wanted to do it, excuse me. Let's uh, make, the, let's keep this the floor. I wanted, actually wanted to change this to the ceiling. Because now I can, now I can cancel some stuff out. So I can, I can cancel this plus K with this minus one. And I can cancel this plus L with this plus one over here. Um, so this whole thing comes out to be two times g minus one plus sum over i of ceiling of a i theta minus sum over j of floor of b j theta. Um, and then I always get confused about which way it goes, but the, the sum of the f ceilings is uh, greater than or equal to the ceiling of the sum. So this thing is greater than or equal to the ceiling of d theta. Um, and this thing is less than or equal to the floor of d theta. So this whole thing is greater than or equal to 2 times g minus 1 uh, plus ceiling of d theta minus floor of d theta 
And because d theta is not an integer, the ceiling minus the floor is equal to 1. So this is equal to uh, 2g. Um, so what does that tell us? So, so it tells us that the index of this multiple cover is greater than or equal to zero. That's a nice fact. It's not true in higher dimensions, unfortunately. But in three dimensions, this branch cover trivial cylinder always has index greater than or equal to zero, and it can be equal to zero. So the index, so the index of u0 is equal to zero if and only if the genus is equal to zero and um, the sum over i of ceiling of a i theta is actually equal to ceiling of d theta and the sum over j of floor of b j theta is equal to the floor of d theta. So this is sometimes true. So in some cases the index is zero. All right, so Little, little combinatorics just for com for comic relief here, <laughs> because the analysis you know we need some jokes in between all the analysis. <laughs> okay, um, great. So that's so. Why did I tell you this? Um, so what's the situation we can have? Is we could have. Uh, we could have a Fredholm index one curve here. Let's call this thing U plus, which has a bunch of negative ends at covers of gamma. Okay, so this U plus could have negative ends at gamma of multiplicities a one through a k. And then I could have some curve U minus. Of also Fred Holm index one, which has positive ends at covers of gamma of multiplicities bj. And then in between them, I could I could I have this curve u0, which sometimes has index zero. So suppose we're in a situation where this thing actually has index zero. So then, in principle, maybe I could glue this configuration. Um, and I want to know how many gluings there are. So the reason why I looked at this problem, or, or uh, Cliff Tobbs and I worked on this problem in our paper, was, was to prove that um, the differential in, in embedded contact homology satisfies d squared equals 0. So for that application, you actually need to glue stuff like this. Although in our paper, we actually did much, something much more general. So we, we glued we more or less anything of this kind, even much more general, generally than what's needed for embedded contact homology. We also did orientations very carefully, if you ever want to read about orientations. Very carefully. <laughs> it, yeah, question? Um, does it have to be a cover of a trivial cylinder, maybe the like, you know, there's more, like, I don't know, different pieces that go different parts of him. I guess that it wouldn't. Um, well, of course, you could certainly do this kind of thing more generally for branch covers of something which is not a trivial cylinder. We didn't do that, although that's, that's of interest when you're trying to look at cobordism maps in embedded contact homology. So Chris Gehrig is thinking about that. It's also an example of the Bauer and Hunger paper, right? Um, that's true, yes. The Bow and Honda paper looks at covers of cylinders, non-trivial cylinders. They're not branched, but they're non-trivial, which come up in chain homotopies for invariance of cylindrical contact homology. It's a very nice, a very nice uh, example of obstruction bundles that they do. Why do you say you much more general? So, uh, I mean, do you say in dimension three or in dimension? We just did dimension three, yeah. But the kinds of configurations that we glued were more general than what you need for ECH. I think one advantage of dimension three here is, is there's sort of low dimensional phenomena related to automatic transversality that will help you prove that the obstruction bubble is well defined. Yeah, that's, that's coming in a second. Yeah. Okay. Right, so in this situation, a situation like this, 
we have an obstruction bundle. So say I want to try to glue this thing. So what is this M? Well, it's basically a moduli space of branch covers. So this, you know, the, I mean, the reason why this is an example of failure of transversality is because the dimension, so this, the moduli space of all such curves U0 is a manifold of, of branch covers of the cylinder, and the dimension is two times the number of branch points. And the number of branch points is uh, k plus l minus 2. Okay? So whenever this thing is not a cylinder, there are some branch points. So it's a moduli space of positive dimension, manifestly. But its index might be 0. So then transversality just doesn't work. There's just absolutely no way you can fix that by choosing a generic J. Life sucks. OK. Um, so now, now you know, in this problem, we could sort of fix the gluing parameters. Um, so we could fix how much we're going to translate the stuff up. And then we have a moduli space of branch covers. Um, and then over each point in this moduli space, we have the, the co-kernel of the operator D0 for the curve U0. So we'll assume that the curves U plus and U minus are cut out transversely. So there, are, so, so we'll assume that, that uh, the operators D plus and minus are surjective, which you can do if at least if these things are somewhere injective, you can assume that for generic J. Uh, however, this, the D0 definitely has a co-kernel. Um, and as, as Chris just pointed out, um, the, the dimension of the co-kernel never varies. So the lemma, um, while I have all those combinatorics up here, uh, one more lemma. Your branch covers don't actually have to be connected, right? Uh, I'm just certainly doing this badly. Um, it's not the right way to do this. Uh, yeah, and generally you could look at non-disconnected branch covers too. On how to use the board? Well, they should have like sent us an instruction manual. Well, you see in like in the restroom, there's like this big instruction sheet on how to wash your hands. <laughs> we need something like that for the boards. <laughs> then we'll have like 25 steps. And, okay. Okay. Right, so the lemma is that uh, the kernel of D0 is always equal to 0. So this is, an, this is um, well, Chris Wendell's talk, he talked about unbranched covers of closed surfaces and proving that those had kernel equal to zero. And here I'm talking about branch covers of, of trivial cylinders. So it's a slightly different thing. So this is just a simple calculation, and it's re related to automatic transversality things. Definition of D0? Right. In fact, I forgot to tell you what D0 is. So D0 is not what you think it is. I'm very sorry. I'm, I'm getting scattered here. So, this is, so first of all, this is a sort of, I want a normal deformation operator. So this, so this operator D0N was a go-to. Well, you could take sort of L21 sections of um, U0 pullback of the normal bundle to the trivial cylinder. Okay. So this is, these are basically sections describing how to move my curve U0 in the directions normal to the trivial cylinder. It, so you could think of this as deformations that don't move the branch points, roughly speaking. This is the same as my normal operator. Yeah. Okay. And then this maps to 
L2 sections of, uh, well, 0, 1 forms on a, a sigma with, with values in this uh, bundle. Yeah. So we're measuring deformations that don't move through branch points. So, so the index, right, so this thing, the dimension of M is two times the number of branch points. Um, and the index of this operator D0 n is minus 2b. So the, the curve u0 itself has index 0. So the, the sort of usual operator for that curve would have index 0. But because I'm sort of restricting the domain of this operator by not allowing the branch points to move, that decreases the index by the number of constraints I put on, which is two times the number of branch points. So that's why the index of this operator is minus 2b. Um, and my lemma is that the kernel is zero, so that this co-kernel has dimension equal to 2b again. So I have a rank 2b bundle over a 2b dimensional base, and I can expect to get some finite count of zeros, which would be the number of ways to glue. Uh, and what's the proof of this? Um, well, so you let, let psi be a non-zero element of the kernel, suppose such a thing exists. Um, you want to count how many zeros does it have. So, so by this sort of Karlman similarity principle, these have isolated zeros, which look like the zeros of a holomorphic function. So the algebraic count of zeros is greater than or equal to zero with equality if and only if it's non-vanishing. Um, now, it will be non-vanishing sort of on the ends. And so at each end, it has a kind of winding number around zero. So as you go around one of these circles in the ends, you can count the winding number of this section around zero. Um, and then the, the number of zeros in the interior is going to be the difference between the winding numbers on the ends. So it's going to be the sum over i, sum from i equals 1 to k, of the winding number with respect to this trivialization tau of psi around the ith positive end. Uh, minus sum from j equals 1 to l of the winding number with respect to tau of psi over the jth negative end. And then you can put bounds on these winding numbers. So basically, the, the asymptotic behavior of psi is described in terms of asymptotic eigenvalue of an asymptotic operator. I certainly don't have time to explain that in detail. But you find that the winding number is less than or equal to uh, the floor of Ai theta while one of these winding numbers is greater than or equal to the ceiling of Bj theta. So then this whole thing is less than or equal to you're right, thank you. So this whole thing is less than or equal to the floor of d theta minus the ceiling of d theta, which is minus 1. So I just showed that 0 is less than or equal to minus 1. Uh, that can't happen. <laughs> well, whoever's reading this is unhappy about this nonsense. <laughs> um, all right, so the, so it's so we have a well-defined instruction bundle. This didn't actually. Did this use the index equal zero assumption? Uh, no, the kernel's always zero. I, I actually suspicious as to whether this really is a low-dimensional phenomenon. Seems seems like it should be related to the fact that the operator for the trivial cylinder is always invertible, which is very general. Mm -hmm. 
All right, let's talk about that later and see if it generalizes. By the way, how much time is left? Uh, like, you started at my watch is 2.15, 2.16, so you've got 20, 20 minutes. minutes left. 20? <laughs> really? Well, <laughs> 17. 17 minutes? Okay. I think 20 is even accurate. Yeah, I think 20 is more accurate. Wow, okay. Time flies when... Or, okay. Well, anyway, all right. Great. I don't know what I'm saying. All right, so, so okay, so we have an obstruction bundle. All right, so this obstruction bundle is good. So we're, we're happy over here. All right, so now we can do obstruction bundle gluing. Uh, so what's the picture? That makes us happy or sad? <laughs> well, it makes us happy that this, this method is applicable. And lucky you, you didn't have to do it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I think people greeted my papers with tubs with a mixture of horror and schadenfreude. <laughs> uh, Okay. Okay, so um So let me do let me do the simplest non-trivial example. So simplest non-trivial example. So this is where um, k equals one, and a one equals two, and l equals two and b1 equals b2 equals 1. So my curve u0 uh, just looks like this, just a pair of pants. The top has degree 2, the bottom has degree 1. This is mapping to r cross gamma. Um, and let's assume, we should assume that theta you know, is between zero and a half. And this is, this is what you need for the index. Well, up to shifting it by an integer, this is what you need for the index to be zero. If eight is between a half and one, the index will be two. Okay. And there's how many branch points are there going to be? There's going to be one branch point. Uh, so it's going to be somewhere over here, mapping to somewhere over there. Um, so the moduli space that branch covers, we can identify just with a cylinder. Um, basically, you just need to keep track of where this branch point is. It's actually, the moduli space is actually a double cover of the cylinder because you need to keep track of asymptotic markers. Um, well, let's not, let's not go into that. Um, now, when you're actually gluing, you're not looking at all branch covers because I've only shifted u plus and u minus down by some finite amount. So there's only a sort of a finite range in which this branch point can be. So this really is actually, is actually something, some interval, say minus r, r uh, cross s1. All right. Then we try to glue these things. So there's going to be an obstruction section. Okay. So, so, um, I can you say again for why you truncated the R of that? Because I shift U plus up by some finite amount, I shift U minus down by some finite amount, and there's only this finite interval in which I can 
put this branch cover. So what I'm, um, the branch point can't be way up there because then I'm far away from gamma. Uh, so when you're writing this, it's really kind of annoying to sort of sort this out and figure out where exactly the branch point can be and so on. Um, right, and then there's another, another simplifying thing you can do, which is um, you can arrange that, um, uh, that the linearized rate flow around gamma is, is um, J linear. Um, in other words, you can choose your J in such a way that um, the rate flow from one point in gamma to another point in gamma is actually a complex linear map. Um, when you do that, this, this, this um, um, causes the normal oper operator D0N to be actually a complex linear operator, not just a real linear operator. It simplifies the calculations a little bit. So the, um, so the co-kernel Well, it's a two-dimensional real vector space or one-dimensional complex vector space. So now I have a complex line bundle over M. So this M is an interval cross S1. I have a complex line bundle over it. But this is more interesting because now, so in my more theory example, the bundle was, was trivial because you had the same co-kernel over every point. But now these, these curves use zero of varying, so they have different co-kernels. So it's a more, more interesting bundle. Then I have some instruction section S, and I have no idea what it is, but I have an approximate section S0. Okay. Uh, so I fixed the gluing parameters. If I say, let's just translate U plus up a lot, U minus down a lot, and just fix it. So the gluing parameters, like some, some constant times this R. Okay. Um, so they have an S0. So S0 has contributions from the, uh, the negative end of U plus and the two positive ends of U minus. Um, and you can actually sort of figure out what these are. So I'll spare you the whole story, but I'll show you what, you, what, it, what it comes out to. So you get that S0, well, I should, let's give these, these things names. So this is say, let's call this S and T. So S, oh, not this again. I have your S0 and S0 sections. Do I have? Okay. Just make it a little large. Uh, right, let's make this stigma and tail. Oh, shit. <laughs> you know, when I was taking undergraduate quantum mechanics, they would write equations on the board like this. It looked like this. P, P equals P, P. <laughs> no. The letter P would mean three different things. So, so there's three different things all in this equation all represented by the letter P. I, I sort of couldn't, 
I found this very difficult to deal with. <laughs> um, but then on the exam, when I had to write my answers, I would just sort of like write the same letter everywhere. <laughs> and then I got an A. So. <laughs> um, all right, I, let, let's, let's put it, we'll put a hat on this, how about that, okay? Is it your trivialization fixed so you can just use tau? Or are you gonna change it later? Uh, like dynamically scoped variables or something, I forgot this, all right. All right, anyway, just S0 hat. So S0 hat, of st, what's it gonna be? So there's gonna be a contribution from the positive end, which is gonna be some constant, say, uh, alpha times, uh, let me get this right, e to the, uh, uh, e to the lambda s plus i t. Or lambda is some, lambda is an eigenvalue, some operator. So basically this, this e to the lambda s means that when the branch point is higher up, you're sort of closer to u plus, so you're seeing more of a contribution. Um, and this it ref re reflects the fact that as the branch point moves around, well, you so see you have to, you have to um, compare these co-current elements for different elements in the moduli space. Um, but, um, to do, to do that, you basically need to understand the winding numbers of these co kernel elements as you go around the end. So this, the fact that that this is uh, this term is here represents the fact that the co kernel element has winding number one as as the as you go around the end. Um, and then there's there's going to be some from the negative ends. There's going to be some contribution. Let's call this I don't know lambda plus uh, of the form e to the Minus lambda minus s, um, and these and these these uh, on the negative end, the co-kernel elements have winding number zero, so there's actually no t term up here, All right? So I don't really have time to expl explain this in full detail, but you get an expression like this, okay? So this is this is actually quite simple. Uh, the the general case where you have lots of branch points. Um, it becomes very challenging to calculate the number of zeros of the section. You need all sorts of tricks. But this case is simple enough that you can see directly what's going on. So what's going on? So um, if S is large, then this term is much bigger than this term. So in the complex plane, when S is large, as T goes around S1, the section's going like this. Okay, so let me label this circle here. If S is small, then this term is very small, and then this term is big, but this is, this is uh, as T goes around the circle, it's a constant. So, so if S is small, it's some little circle like this. And then on that finite cylinder, you're interpolating between these two circles. And one of these circles has winding number one around zero, and the other one has winding number zero, so the number of zeros is equal to one. So there's one way to glue, up to signs. Uh, in the general case, we, we calculated the number of ways to glue something like this. Um, we found kind of remarkably that the number of ways to glue is equal to one if and only if you have exactly the kind of data that comes up in embedded contact homology. Otherwise, you get some number other than one. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> um, all right, so in my remaining three minutes, let me just close with a question, which we can think about next week. Uh, so next week, Helmut's gonna tell us the definition of SFT. Um, so SFT is supposed to count index one things, but not just index one curves, but any sort of index one building. So you could have a, an index one building which looks like this. So there's some, 
There's some nice, so let's say we can make it embedded if you like, embedded index equals one piece. Perfectly good curve. This is the kind of thing we want to count. And then maybe attached to it are some branch covers of trivial cylinders. Um, so they can be attached above it. So these have some branch points in them. Or below it, they could also, in sort of worst cases, this thing could have some additional ends. Um, at covers of the same orbit and there could be some further branch covers of trivial cylinders on the side. Okay? So you have some building where one piece is an embedded index one curve and then there are a bunch of other pieces either above it, below it, or on the side which are index zero branch covers of trivial cylinders. And something like this should make some contribution to the SFT differential. And the question is, how much? So my question is, what, what is the contribution to the SFT differential? So I have some conjectures about this, but it's not really well defined question until we've seen the definition of the SFT differential. I uh, think it might depending on, I mean, so you have solutions <laughs> on the boundary on corners and you have an algorithm kicking certain things in a systematic way, kicking certain things in and out. So, and there are some conventions. And depending on the conventions, I mean, they lead to, lead to the same algebraic theory. So I think it's conceivable that actually depending on your convention, the answer to your question would be different. Yeah, that's exactly what I expect. So I expect this to depend on some choices. So just to draw the picture for the simple example that I did. So we did this example where you glue a pair of pants in between two index one things like this. So this is index one, this is index zero, this is index one. We found that the number of ways to glue this equals one. Now, this sort of configure this building consisting of the upper piece plus the middle piece makes some contribution to the SFT differential. I don't know what. Let's call it C plus. And this lower piece obtained by gluing the lower piece to the middle makes some other contribution. Let's call it C minus. And this sort of forces us, you know, modulo, I guess you need, in general you need some combinatorial factors in the SFT differential, but ignoring that, the fact that there's one way to glue basically forces that C plus plus C minus equals one in order to get D squared equals zero. Uh, and I would expect that you could sort of choose one of these to be whatever you want, and then the other one is forced by this equation. So I have some more general conjectures along these lines, like, you, because the number of gluings is one. So um, <coughs> there's, there's an end of the index two moduli space converging to this thing. So it has to be somehow counted by d squared. So either this thing, it could be counted as c plus times this thing, which is contributing one. Um, I, I'm ignoring the signs here. Um, or as this thing, c minus times one. So the total contribution to the differential squared is c plus plus c minus. That has to be one. Uh, it'd be nice if I could say that you could make the choices such that whenever there's some junk on the top, it counts zero, for example. Although I'm a little confused about what to do when there's stuff on the side. I don't really understand that. Um, I was actually thinking about this question 10 years ago. In fact, I think I gave a completely incomprehensible talk about this 10 years ago. But I think maybe, maybe now we have the language in place where we can actually answer it. All right, thanks. So on this, uh, so in the middle part, so for the picture, in the embedded part, do you assume, do you make like a standard PCH assumption, so no, no multiple colors of the hyperbolic orbit? No, I'm not assuming that. It doesn't have to be one of the things counted by ECH. Although that's, of course, an interesting case. So those, are, those are the assumptions that need to be answered if I'm doing <laughs> um, 
Right, well this is a different question. This is not a question about how many gluings, it's a question about how do you want to count this. So SFT says there are some numbers, maybe depending on some choices, that have the properties to give you an invariant. And silly people like me say, yeah, well, what are, are these numbers exactly <laughs> in these examples? So if you had a slightly more complicated thing where you had, say, three what, times winding, right? just, just one end at the top and three times winding, um, but then you have three separate disconnected things of order one at the bottom, then I seem to remember you had this partition. Of, I mean, is, is there one way to do that, or do you have to partition it into two things and get... I think in that case, the number of gluings was also one. But it's in general, it's a kind of complicated combinatorial formula, which I don't remember off the top of my head. Right. Um, it's, it's in the beginning of paper one, part one of the two-part paper with Tom. So there's some complicated combinatorial formula for the number of gluings. Right, but when you split things, when you sort of stretch along the torus, yeah. and, and you, so you have a small orbit, you have something, sort of the, the ECH thing that you get is sort of multi, one multiply covered thing at the top, the generic one, and then lots of single ends at the bottom. Um, right, yeah, so these partition conditions would say that, yeah, yeah so in this um, picture, if you're actually looking at, if your U plus and U minus are counted by ECH, then the, the numbers A, I, and B, J are determined by D and the, um, and the, and the angle theta. So if the angle theta is positive and very small, mm -hmm. then at the top, you, as you said, you have just one end. And at the bottom, you have d ends, well, multiple c. And ends. it's just splitting into one thing in the middle? It, or would it split into lots of things in the middle? Actually? Oh, just one thing. So I don't, really, I don't really think of splitting the middle into levels. We don't really look at it that way. Yeah, so Chris Gehrig will answer all of your technical questions. <laughs> and he also, if you don't have technical questions, he has a couple of sort of other examples of this phenomenon prepared to tell you about. So otherwise it was uh, brought to my attention that the next speaker wants to have plenty of time for a leisurely coffee after lunch. Therefore, we will reconvene at 2.15 and let's thank Michael again.